So there's this guy, right, and he races cross and he races on the road. He hails from the Netherlands and he's won the Amstel Gold Race in a sprint. He took the Tour of Flanders, he'd finished third in Paris-Roubaix. He's won stages of the Tour de France. He's a six-time Dutch cyclocross champion. He's won the World Cup, the Super Prestige, and become world champion in the discipline of cyclocross. Of course, you all know who I'm talking about. Mr. Van der Poel. Adrie van der Poel. Adrianus Adrie van der Poel was born in the Dutch town of Bergen op Zoom in the southwest of the Netherlands on the 17th of June 1959. He would grow up in, in and around the village of Hogeheide in his family of farmers. I'm not entirely sure how Adrie ended up racing, but by 1978 he'd be right at the pointy end of numerous amateur races, and by 97 he'd podium the amateur national championships on the road. By 1980 he'd start taking amateur victories, enough for the DAF cycling team to sign him for the 1981 season, placing him alongside riders such as Roger de Vlaminck, Henny Kuiper and Henny Stamsnyder. In 1981, Adrie would make his first foray into elite cyclocross by finishing 6th at the national championships, but his focus would largely be on the road, where his season would be highlighted by an impressive 2nd place at La Fleche Wallonne and victory on the first stage of the Dauphiné. The Dutch very much had a new talent to look towards. After his debut in 81, Adrie would kick straight into the highest possible gear. For 1982, debuting the Tour de France, the Amstel Gold Race and all five monuments, he would get a taste of what it was like to race these races. Whilst he may not get any major results this year, by 1983 things were looking different. In Gent Revelgem he'd finish 4th, just missing the podium, but he'd go crazy during the Autumn Classics too. He'd finished third at Il Lombardia, second at Paris Tour, and he debuted the World Championships, held that year in the Swiss Altenrhein. Whilst Greg LeMond would fly to the world title, Adrie would win the sprint from the second group, beating the likes of Stephen Roach and Claude Kikillon. His strong form would last out the winter too. Adrie would this year, according to some sources, take his first cyclocross victory in Chavre. The official super prestige victory from that year is attributed to countryman Henry Stomsnyder, but numerous sources cite Adrie having also won a cross on the classic course in 1983. He'd also podium the national championships, finishing second behind the aforementioned Stomsnyder. Somewhere in 1983 though, Adrie would land himself in bother with the doping authorities for supposed use of strychnine commonly used as a pesticide to kill small rodents. It has been thought that the small muscle contractions caused by the chemical could benefit athletic performance. Adri's explanation for the issue was that he had recently eaten a pigeon and that somewhere in that process the strychnine will have come into play. He was thus not punished for this. A year later though, he would get popped for doping again during the Tour of Sicily, more specifically for ephedrine usage. Ephedrine is a stimulant that tends to make people more alert and works to widen the airways. Two pretty decent advantages in a bike race. Adri was thus banned from competition for three months, and he felt that he'd been targeted by the UCI after earlier escaping punishment for the strychnine incident. You see, during 1984, ephedrine was still commonly found in cough medicines, and though it is no longer the case in the Netherlands, during the time, that was a pretty valid explanation. It's worth mentioning that these are the only incidents involving doping during Adri's entire career, a career that would last some 16 or so years. So whilst his 1984 road season went up in smoke slightly, he would focus his eyes on cross to keep fit for the next season. But slowly it would become apparent that he was actually quite a handy crosser as well. Another national championship silver came, but the big result was his victory in Zurich, a career first victory in the Super Prestige. In fact, he was only the third person ever to win a Super Prestige race. Only Henny Stomsteiner and Roland Liberton had managed it up to that point. Ari's victory would be the only time that season that Roland Liberton 
was not victorious in the competition. But whilst Libertin may have been good in the fields, he was nothing on the road where Adri was back and he had a point to prove. In 1985, he'd racked together quite the collection of minor classic wins with San Sebastian, Paris Bruxelles, the Brabant Appel, and the Schelde Prize. He'd also finish second in Lombardy and make his serious go for the next cross season too, racing five of the eight super prestiges that season and debuting the World Championships held that year in Munich, a World Championships that subverted expectations in many, many ways. At the 1985 World Championships, there was only really one favourite, Roland Liboton. The Belgian showman had won four of the past five world titles, his only miss being 1981, where he finished second. Den Roel had dominated cross for the past few years, with Henny Stomsneider and Albert Zweifel generally being the ones to pick up the scraps. But Munich 1985 would be one of those moments where a generational shift would occur. Zweifel never started the race, Stomsteider would DNF midway through, whilst Liberton would struggle massively and finish 10th. On the ice and snow, German home racer Klaus Peter Thaler, at 36, would crown himself world champion for the first time, achieving his first big victory. Behind him, Adri's debut would see him clamber to an incredible second place, finishing a mere handful of seconds behind Thaler. Luxembourg's Claude Michelis would finish in third. He'd also take his career best finish, a real world championships of outsiders. Despite his impressive performance at the Worlds, Adri would keep his eyes firmly locked on the road, barely racing cross over the next two seasons, whilst on the road he would podium in Lombardy, Liège and Roubaix. In 1986, Adri would achieve his biggest career victory, winning the Tour of Flanders, beating Irish legend Sean Kelly, as well as Jean-Philippe van den Brande and Canada's Steve Bauer in the sprint. By 1987, he'd add Paris Tour to his palmares as well, and claim a stage of the Tour de France. 1987 would also be the year that Adri would fall in love, forming a relationship with Corinne Poulidor, the daughter of the infamous Raymond Poulidor, the man labelled the Eternal Number no. 2, for his many second places in the Tour de France that he'd never quite managed to win. And over the next few years, Adri would himself become an eternal number two of sorts. By 1987, he would also return to cross in a somewhat serious fashion. After starting slightly poorly at the Super Prestige in Zurich, he would get better and better throughout the season, eventually landing himself a top five in Vetsicon a week before the world, held this year in Hegendorf, Switzerland. The course in Hegendorf was an incredible mud bath with long running sections and the loose mud creating difficult descents too. Roland Liberton had something to put right after his recent Pura showings at the world and so attacked early on, dragging with him home favourites Pascal Richard and Bert Breu. Adri would commence on a solo chase, dropping a group with amongst others Zweifel and Stomsneider, as by lap 3 he'd make the connection up front, just as his fellow Dutch speaker would start to fade. Adri was now up against Breu and Richard alone. And it would prove to be just too much. Richard would soar off into the distance and take his only world title. Adri would take second, his second cyclocross silver medal and his third silver in total. The start of a potentially worrying trend. Luckily, outside of world championships, Adri did still know how to win. In 88, he'd take his second career monument by winning Liege Baston Liege. And back in cross, he'd win himself a first Dutch national title as well before trekking off to Pontchâteau for the 1989 Worlds. In Pontchâteau, he'd be arguably the biggest favourite, his road cycling profile suited the course quite well, and he would set about quickly stamping his authority on the race, monitoring his rivals, weakening them bit by bit. However, the one man he had failed to keep his eyes on was a rank outsider. Denny de Bee had taken a shock silver two years ago in Mlada Boleslav, but was not a leading figure in cross. His unprofessional training habits meant that he wasn't really amongst the top level riders. However, his innate talent and technical abilities definitely were. In Pontchâteau, de B would write cyclocross folklore at Adri's expense. De B would successfully jump the barriers set on the course, something nobody else in the race was able to accomplish. 
The advantage this gave him lap after lap was monumental and it was certainly enough to sway the title into the hands of Denny de Bee, as Adrie van der Poel was once again second best. Twelve whole months later, Adrie would start to venture more towards Cross as his road career began to wind down, now in his early to mid 30s. A second national title would prove that Adrie's level in Cross was still there and made him amongst the biggest favourites for the world again, while this time in Quecho in Spain. Quecho was similar to Ponchateau with a somewhat flat fast course. Once again the race would stay tightly compacted and once again a rank outsider would show up Adrie on the day. Henk Baars was a proper outsider, never really winning a major race but he was always there or thereabouts. But in Quecho he would have his big day, taking his biggest victory as Adrie would sprint to a third silver medal five seconds later. In 1990 Adrie would take his final major road win by winning the Amstel Gold Race before starting his transition over the cross full time. That winter he'd win himself a second super prestige round in Gavre and he would start the year with his now traditional 1-2 of winning the Dutch Nationals and bottling the World Championships. This time with the added twist of the Worlds being a home race for Adrie as they were hosted in Gieten. The race in Gieten would go down to the wire, Adrie van der Poel versus Radomir Simonek. The two could not shake each other going all the way down to a final sprint. Simonek would lead them out and Adrie had not hit the front for a whole lap. He'd played it perfectly, conserved energy, he was ready for this. But nonetheless in the sprint he could not come round the check and so Adrie would roll home to a fourth consecutive silver medal. Adrie himself was now an eternal number two. As Adri's road career would start to wind down, he would shift his focus more towards racing cross full time, still combining the two but sharing the focus between disciplines. That would culminate at the Worlds in Leeds in 1992, where after his fourth Dutch title, Adri would again attempt to finally drag home a world title, an attempt that would end up being unsuccessful once again. Mike Kluger would claim his only world title, Adri would end up in third, with Camille Camerda being second. It had now been five medals, but never a gold, and Adri could be forgiven for wondering if he'd ever have his luck on his side. Over the next few years, Adri's focus would shift further and further towards Cross as he started to race full seasons, and that would pay its dividends as he would win himself numerous super prestige rounds, and in Lunhout, he would take his first trophy victory. Due to the fact that Adri was now racing entire cross seasons though, he was no longer able to use his freshness to gain an advantage during the World Championships, and this may go some way to explain his slight drop in results at the Worlds, as he'd take two fifth places and a fourth, still very impressive performances. Another potential explanation is that Adri's home life might have gotten slightly busier. Adri and Corinne would welcome their two sons into the world, First, David van der Poel in 1992, and in 1995 came a certain Mathieu van der Poel. Maybe it was the look of having his kids by his side inspiring him, or maybe he'd fully adopted to racing cross seasons, or maybe it was his near total retirement from the road. But after what looked like a steady decline over the past few years, the 1995-96 season would see Adri spring back to life. He'd win again in the Super Prestige, and grab a handful of other one day classic victories and by the time the world came round Adri was back at his best, his best that had gotten him all those silver medals and finally he was hoping to go one better. In Montreuil, France, the riders would be served a proper race of attrition on a course that was selective enough to consistently weaken riders but not enough to cause major splits and it caused a tense and tactical race and by the final lap Eight riders were still in contention, including Adri, his Dutch teammate Richard Groenendaal, Belgium's Erwin Vervecken, and Italians Luca Bramati and Daniele Pontoni. Throughout the last lap, nobody would be able to deliver that decisive blow until Adri hammered it around halfway through the lap. Bramati would be able to respond, and using all his might, Pontoni dragged himself into contention too, as they reached the very last corner. Just five years ago in Gieten, he had been in this exact situation. Adri had let Schumannek lead it out and that had cost him the win 
and he was not going to make that mistake this time. He'd launch it right from the front, powering away from the Italians behind him, and he would soar to a very well-earned, very first world title. His year in the Rainbow Jersey would be his best year as a crosser. He'd snatch up 12 major victories, including his first World Cup rounds in Prague and Coxsider, also taking home the World Cup overall, the first Dutchman to do so. Adri would also win himself four Super Prestige rounds and the overall of that competition, and three trophy rounds, and the individual race in Lunhout, quite the classic. At the Worlds, he would attempt to defend his title, but a piece of tactical blasé Italian brilliance would see Daniele Pontoni take the title, as Adri would land himself a very respectable fourth place. And by the end of this, Adri would retire from racing on the road completely. In cross, he'd keep on winning, however, taking more individual rounds in all three major competitions, as well as a whole host of individual victories. In 1999, Adri would win the cross in his hometown of Hogeheide, the race being graced with the name of the Grote Prijs, Adri van der Poel. Also in 1999, Adri would take his sixth and final Dutch cross title, a decade after he took his first. And in Poprad, Adri would take his eighth World Championships medal, finishing third behind the Belgian duo of Mario de Klerk and Erwin Verfecke. As we entered a new decade, Adri announced his retirement as a professional, riding one last season. In his final year as a pro, he would not take any major victories, but he did successfully win the standalone races of Harderwijk and Lutherbach. On the flip side though, Adri would not miss the top 10 on a single occasion, showcasing that he really still had it. Adri would finish his final Dutch Championships in second place, and a 15th national medal would thus follow. At the Worlds, the infamous 2000 Worlds in St. Michael Gestel, Adri would be tangentially embroiled in the controversy surrounding his Rabobank teammates Richard Groenendaal and Sven Nijs. Whilst the podium was tears all round, Adri would finish in fourth place, missing out on all the drama on the podium. Adri's final race would be the Super Prestige in Heerlen, two weeks after the Worlds. He would round off the race in third place, podiuming on his retirement. In his retirement, Adri has turned into somewhat of a cycling guru, popping up in all kinds of places. He's taken over as the lead organiser and course builder for his very own GP Adri van der Poel in Hogeheide. The race is the staple finale of the World Cup and is set to host the World Championships in 2023. Adri is amongst the most respected course builders in the world, and to me personally, I think he's the best. He's able to find this perfect balance between exciting and engaging layouts, but also creating courses that stay close, compact and exciting until the very end. Adri is arguably most known nowadays for his offspring. David has gone on to carve a very decent career for himself, however back injuries have left him struggling somewhat. Mathieu, meanwhile, has effectively shaped the way cycling has changed over the last years. Being almost certainly the best crosser in the world for the past five years, and arguably being outright the best cyclist in the world, Mathieu has followed his father's footsteps by winning world and national titles, tour stages, and monuments. Throughout his decades long career, Adri would rake in huge victories throughout both the road and the cross. In cross, Adri would grab a grand total of 53 elite victories, the oldest dating to 1982, whilst his final win came after the turn of the millennium. Adri's best years were his twilight years. It was during this time that he would take three World Cup round victories and snap up the overall ones. Adri would also win 13 rounds of the Super Prestige, six rounds of the Trophée, and win the Super Prestige once overall as well. With six national titles, Adri is amongst a group of highly decorated riders who've dominated the Dutch national cross scene. His six titles puts him level with his son Mathieu and Lars Boom, behind only legends such as Henny Stamsnijder, Richard Groenendaal, Daphne van den Brandt and Marianne Vos. Alongside his six national titles sits of course his crowning achievement, the 1996 World Championships. Of course, the big thing that Adri has over many other riders is his ridiculous road palmares as well, including two stages of the Tour de France, Paris Tour, Paris Bruxelles, 
die Amstel Gold Race aan twee monuments, de Ronde van Vlaanderen en Liège Baston Liège. A thoroughly filled out and gorgeous palmares. Adrie is a farmer's boy through and through, and that work ethic has been instilled in him from his youth and always remained. More than anything else, that's exactly what he was, the hardest worker that you could possibly imagine. His being a relentless training machine would largely be the reason that he was still so good well into his late thirties. Adrie's other big advantage would of course be his road background. His big road engine being able to deliver long consistent power and long consistent attacks, able to sort of strangle his rivals and slowly sap their energy. Adri was therefore also suited more towards courses that required lots of stamina and lots of large power outputs. He was of course though very versatile. Adri's focus more on the road than on cross in his early years meant that he'd often be fresher when he did start racing cross compared to his rivals. He'd take time to take a break after the road season and thus early in the cross season, meaning that by the time he did race later in the year, he was often a lot more rested and a lot fresher and readier to race the races than his rivals who were tired. It's something you still see a lot of road riders do to this day. Van Aert, Van der Poel, Pidcock, Mariana Vos is probably the best example of the last season. Adrie van der Poel holds a very peculiar position in cyclocross history. He himself carved out an incredible career in cross, but a large chunk of his palmares consists of seconds and thirds. What he did do in cross is also largely overshadowed by his equally brilliant road victories. And then to top it all off, his son is arguably the greatest crosser of all time, sometimes relegating him to just the father of Mathieu, a point of view that is incredibly harsh on Adrie's massive legacy. A legacy that he, building his courses every year, still continues to grow each year. Adri's position as a cyclocross legend or whatever is, is therefore a really weird one. But what I think we can all agree on is that he is an absolute legend of the sport. And one of the more influential people in turning the sport into what we know it to be nowadays. <laughs>